Thank you for joining us. We will be listening to Norma Elia Cantu read from Canicula, Snapshots of a Girlhood in La Frontera. Also, some poetry from Meditación Fronteriza and uh, poems honoring Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz. Norma Elia Cantu is the president for the American Folklore Society. She is also a professor at Trinity University, a Merkison professor in the humanities at Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas. Let's welcome Norma Elia Canto. Hi, welcome. Today is November 1st. Uh, hoy es el primero de noviembre. Mi nombre es Graciela Vega Sendejas. Estamos aquí en Watsonville y también en Texas en virtual modo. We're here doing this reading with Norma Elia Cantu. She is a um, Merkison Professor of Humanities at Trinity University, uh, teaches Latinx studies, creative and folklore. Entonces estamos aquí con la profesora eh, Norma Elia Cantu, eh, profesora en la Universidad de Trinity. Eh, está aquí haciendo este especial para la Costa Central, para Watsonville y todas las comunidades. Queremos que te conozcan su trabajo. So we want you to get to know Professor Normelia Cantu, who is um, a writer and has contributed to the Chicano literature, Chicanex canon. Entonces, uh, bienvenida esta noche. Gracias. Muchas gracias a ti, Graciela. Y muchas gracias a tu público, que esperemos uh, les agrade lo que voy a compartir. I really hope that they enjoy what I'm going to share. Mm-hmm. Welcome. So do you want me to go ahead and just do the reading? Yes, yes. So okay. um we we're really um we're very lucky and fortunate to have you read tonight from your poetry and also from Canicula, which is one of your classics. Que la yeah. gente de aquí conozca tu trabajo. Sí. Y voy a comenzar con Canicula. Eh, estamos grabando en octubre, um, no, en noviembre, el primero de noviembre y estoy en San Antonio, Texas, eh, la tierra de los indígenas de esta área, the indigenous people of this area, were a Coahuiltecan group. El nombre de San Antonio, San Antonio was known as Yanawana. And so I want to honor the ancestors from this land as I do my reading. Uh, and all the, the pieces I've chosen from Canicula have to do with Halloween and Dia de los Muertos, because when I was growing up, it was very different. We didn't have the same kind of ofrendas that we do now. And so I wanted to kind of remember that because it is November. And then I'm also gonna then read from uh, Meditación Fronteriza, which is a, a poetry book. Um, there, you can, you can see it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, that came out last year in 2019, and uh, a couple of poems from there. So it's the first piece is called Halloween. It's Halloween, but we haven't donned costumes. We didn't yet believe in that strange U.S. custom. Only my younger siblings did many years later. Mama Grande and her oldest daughter, Tia Lidia, have come to visit to clean the Lapida in Nuevo Laredo, where Mama Grande's dead children are buried, and to place fresh flowers in tin cans wrapped in foil, and they hang beautiful wreaths. They have come to honor their dead. But it is the day before, October 31st. Mommy and Papi and Welly leave me alone with our guests and the kids. I'm fixing dinner, showing off that I can cook and feed the kids. I have made flour tortillas, measuring ingredients with my hands, the way mommy and Welly do. Five handfuls of flour, some salt, a handful of shortening, some espauda from the red can marked KC. Once it's all mixed in, the shortening broken into bits no bigger than peas, I pour hot water, almost boiling, but not quite and knead the dough, shape it into a fat ball, like a bowl turned over, and let it stand while I prepare the sauce that I will use for the fideo. When it is time, I form the small testales, the size of my small fist. I roll out the tortillas, 
small and round, the size of saucers, and cook them on the comal. As they cook, I pile them up on a dinner plate, wrap them in a cloth embroidered with a garland of tiny flowers, red, blue, yellow, and crocheted edge in pink, pale pink. We eat fideo, beans, tortillas, quietly because Mama Grande and Tia Lidia watch us. We drink the cinnamon tea with milk. I look outside and see a huge moon rising. It's the same color as the warm liquid in my cup Later, Tino and Dalia wash the dishes, and even later, the kids are watching TV quietly, without arguing. Mama Grande rocks in the sillon out on the porch, can't understand why some kids, all ragged and costumed as hobos and clowns, come and ask for treats. I try to explain, but it's impossible. My siblings want fritos. So I cut some corn tortillas Mama Grande has brought from Monterrey into strips and heat the grease in an old skillet. I'm busy frying the strips and soaking the grease off on a clean dish rag when all of a sudden the skillet turns and I see the hot grease fall as if in slow motion. My reflexes are good, but the burning on my foot tells me I wasn't fast enough. At first, it doesn't hurt. But then I feel it, the skin and to the bone, as if a million cactus thorns, the tiny nopal thorns, have penetrated my foot. I scream with pain. Mama Grande rushes and puts butter on the burn. I cry. The kids are scared. Later, Doña Lupe will have to do the healing de susto. They have, so, they have been so frightened. When mommy and papi return, they scold me for not being careful. I miss school for a few days. And when I go back, my foot and ankle wrapped in gauze and cotton bandages attract attention. I'm embarrassed. When my social studies teacher, Mrs. Kaysen, the wife of a future senator, concerned, asks, I tell her the truth. Did you go to the hospital? Did a doctor examine the burn? No, I say, knowing it's the wrong answer but not wanting to lie. She shakes her head. I know not to tell her how every three hours, day and night for three days, mommy remembering Wellis Remedios has been putting herb poultices on the burn and cleaning it thoroughly. She has punctured the water-filled ampulla with a maguey thorn and tells me there won't even be a scar. And there isn't. So that's the first of a series of stories that have to do with Halloween and then Day of the Dead and visiting the tombs. The next one is called Campo Santo. Mama Grande returned to Monterrey, perplexed by those children who had come to our door, shyly asking, trick or treat, and fleeing when she told them to go away. I remembered Welly, my other grandmother, and missed lighting candles for the animas perdidas. We had prayed so her dead would find peace. But what I regretted most was missing the visit to the Campo Santo to visit Buelito's tomb because you couldn't visit if you were sick or had a wound, even something as minor as a scratch, much less a burn like mine. So I stayed across the street at mommy's friend's house where the daughters, Alicia, Yadela, sat amid stacks of papel foil, tissue, crepe, busily fix flower arrangements and put finishing touches on wreaths of marigold yellow, sky blue, bougainvillea purple, crepe, crepe flowers, roses, red, white, salmon, yellow, my favorites. They make them in all stages from barely budding ones to those in full bloom with petals that turn and twist and bloom like the real roses. Then, Father, their father, Don Viviano, cuts sugarcane stalks that lean across against the wall, tall as the house, into food long pieces. He hacks the stalks with a machete the size of a sword, chewing the cane for the juicy caña syrup. I turn to the book I have brought. Don Viviano tells me his son Raul so loved to read, he went crazy. 
Mm. Everyone knows that's what books do to you. Yes, Raul had a strong head, a strong mind, but he still succumbed and became like a child. Of course, it could have been a, cure, a curse one of his girlfriends put on him when he wouldn't marry her, preferred his <laughs> books. In any case, it's the books. No, Viviano tells me that's what happens. It weakens the head, the mind. Te vuelven loco. I stop reading and think of Raul. I barely remember him, a silent young man, radish hair, green eyes, sitting on a stool in the corner of the tiny kitchen. What happened to Raul, I ask? May he be at peace, Don Viviano says solemnly and gestures with his head toward the Campo Santo. I want to ask more, but he gets up sullen and silently walks into the house. I think of the Campo Santo. Now we're in the Campo Santo, Huesario. From Don Viviano's front yard where I sit beyond the low wall, I can see the Huesario. I had never noticed it until the year before. I had been afraid Walito's bones might end up there. Mommy reassured me. Only those who don't own their own terreno are disinterred and their bones thrown into the Huesario. She and Tia Licha had paid for Buelito's terreno, so I had nothing to fear. They had also planned the maguey, planted the maguey at his feet like he had always said he wanted. He loved tequila that much. He was, his was a poor tomb with only a simple cross that read Maurilio Ramon. The dates faded and undecipherable. Quite a poor tomb compared to the one that housed Mama Grande's dead. The monument spanned two lots, was made of heavy marble. So far, it housed five of her seven dead children. Lucita, who had been killed at 12 by a stray bullet when she was walking to the corner store with her friend. Anita, who had died of a fever at age two. Gonzalo, who had been stabbed in a fight and had died of a fever, I'm sorry, who had died in a fight at a dance and died instantly. He was 32. And the two Angelitos, who had died only hours after birth, twins she had named Rafael and Refugio after her brothers. The other two were buried in Las Minas Cemetery in Dolores, upriver from Laredo, no one ever visited those. They had died in infancy when the family lived there between the time of the revolution and the first world war. I regretted not being able to walk, not being allowed to visit the dead. No, that year I didn't go to listen to Mama Grande chat with those who came to clean the neighboring tombs who also were remembering their dead, telling stories of their lives. Now, the last of the series there, it's a series, you know, the book has stories from all over and, and jump around, but these happen to all be in a little group and I call it the Halloween series. Mm. Lucita, every year Mama Grande hired a young boy to carry water in a pail to clean the tomb. She also hired one of the sign painters who stood at the entrance soliciting patrons as they came in. Most who came to honor their dead, brought fresh flowers, sempuales, grisantema, resedad, jasmines. They also brought wreaths of crepe paper flowers dipped in wax. Among the ever popular roses, the wreaths sometimes sparted, red hibiscus, yellow and white margaritas, even white calla lilies and various shades of green leaf bouquets arranged around a wire frame wrapped in green crepe paper. Many brought the tools that they would need to clean their tombs and pull out weeds, a broom, a hoe, of course, a pail for water. But many, like Mama Grande, preferred to hire someone there to do the job. Then she could visit with the neighbors telling stories. One story she always told was how her younger, youngest daughter, Maria de la Luz, was named after her dead Lucita, 
who had been truly beautiful, who would sing like a bird, who had been killed by a stray bullet. A gypsy had foretold young Lucita's destiny. Mama Grande sitting in the plaza in Laredo, Mexico, after going to mass at Santo Nino Church one Sunday, holds Lucita on her lap when a gitana approaches her and putting her hand on Lucita's head proclaims, this child shall die young and in tragedy. Mm. She'll never know sorrow or pain. Mama Grande tries to plead with a gitana not to place such a curse on her child, but the gitana insists it is not a curse, but the child's destiny. Nothing can be done about it. Mama Grande then lives with such worry that she became overprotective of the child. But with time, she became careless. And that day, like any other, Lucita goes to the corner store with a neighbor girl on an errand. As they pass a neighbor's house, the neighbor's son is cleaning his pistol, accidentally fires one shot, the shot meant for her Lucita. It hit her in La Cien, killing her instantly. She was 12 years old. Mama Grande never tires of telling the story, crossing herself as she repeats the last words. Y murió al instante. Mm. And that's the series. And there's one more that I'll read. It's called Trick or Treat. Mm. 30 years later, I returned with the Alicia on Day of the Dead to clean Buelito's tomb. We visited with her comadre Adela, whose parents, Don Viviano and Doña Simona, were also now buried in the cemetery across the street. As soon as we arrived, she sent a grandchild to buy some soft drinks from a house a few doors down, and we drank them readily thirsty in the November morning heat. The living room, even smaller than I remembered, was packed with flower arrangements at various stages of completion. Yes. She was still making the wreaths, the only, but only on special occasions and for special orders did she still create her most artistic arrangements with crepe paper flour dipped in wax. Most of her customers preferred plastic or silk. They last longer. And her daughters who are now helping in the business have persuaded her to accommodate her new customers. After the visit, Tia Licha and I make our way to the Camp Camposanto, leaving the car there, promising to return for dinner. As in the old days, stands lined the street outside the cemetery, some sold taquitos, enchiladas, corn on the cob, fruit, slices of jicama, pineapple, watermelon, kept in a glass case with a block of ice, even the tall sugarcane stalks, the color of plum, not quite ripe, leaned here and there against the wall of the cementerio. Some sold flower arrangements. Only a few boys were ready and willing to carry water and clean the tombs, and we had to search for almost an hour before we found someone who could repaint the cross, crudely paint the words and dates, Maurilio, Ramon. Everywhere I turned, I saw change. But the most drastic change was a very tall Frankenstein figure in full costume, makeup and all, who stood at the gate and handed out flyers announcing a Halloween sale at La Argentina, a nearby store. Street children wore masks, painted faces, ragged clothes over their usual rags, and otherwise disguised themselves, and with outstretched hands asked us for Tricky treat, Dia de los Muertos had taken on a new meaning. Mm. So that's that series um, for Halloween and Day of the Dead. And yes, the change, the book is called A Creative Autobioethnography, Canicula. Mm -hmm. And the reason it is an autobioethnography, it's because it is autobiographical about my life growing up on the border, but also because it has a lot of ethnographic material, like mm -hmm. the traditions. And so I write about the different traditions, Christmas, you know, the tamaladas, all the different things that we do. So I'm going to switch now. And I don't want to finish, uh, 
take up all my time reading from curricula. <laughs> so, no, but thank you, thank you so much. I think um, when I used to teach high school, my high school students loved your book, Canicula. And I think that um, here in the Central Coast, uh, we can invite high school students and middle school students to read your book, as well as their teachers. Oh, and that's so, wonderful. Yeah, so we'll be sharing this, this reading with here. And um, I think that I invite them to get their own copy and even our local Watsonville Public Library to have a copy of your book in the teen section. I think it would be wonderful to have them have your book, so. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, como no. And now I'm going to switch to Meditación Fronteriza. November 12th is the anniversary, it's a birthday, of Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, the person that I call the second feminist of the Americas. Mm. Who was the first? I'll tell you. Her name is Maquil Chochilzin, and she was an indigenous poet. And so I say that she was the first feminist of the Americas because the poem that we have from her, and she wrote it even before the Europeans got here, was a what was at the time very much what poets did. They went out to the battle and they recorded what was happening. And so she records a battle that happened with the Aztecs, with the Nahuas, and Achacayatl was the El Señor that she was with, with the the battle was going on. And she tells of the battle and how an Otomi is wounded. But mm. this is what makes it feminist. She asks the women, the poet puts in the women in the poem and talks about how the Otomi's women come and talk to Achacaedro. And mm. I haven't seen any other poem from that era. They all do the same. They all talk about the battles, all of that, but none have the women coming in and speaking, and she puts them in. So that's why I think she's the first feminist. Pero Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, who was a child prodigy, multilingual, a brilliant scholar, writer, scientist, she was the second feminist in my estimation. And the poem that I that everybody knows is called Hombres Necios. And she was born on November 12, 1648. So you can see it was only, what, about 100 years, 200 years after Columbus. Um, and she was just renowned all over the world. Well, in Spain, especially, that's where she was published. So I wrote a poem, A Sor Juana. Mm. And uh, this one is called A Sor Juana. Juana Inés, ¿cómo es que aguantaste tanto? How did you survive? Or did you? I feel your heavy habit on my thin shoulders, on my legs, rough spun stockings, the chin pinched tight as an orange, es de esas de Sevilla. And your words, your daring words, circumscribe your world, expanded. Your world popped into mine, y me enseñaste. Fearlessly you faced them all, your critics, your family, your lovers, your teachers, detractors and supporters, men and women who didn't understand, didn't know you. I was lost in a book. You saved me. You found me in an imaginable future, a mere flicker in your time and space. You rescued me from the abyss from a life without prayer, without poetry, without women. You are the savior, the longed for, the dreamed for, feared yet welcome. It was 1970 and your collected works, a gift for my 23rd birthday, saved me from myself. Gracias. Sí, gracias a Sor Juana. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He sets an example for so many, um, for so many students, you know, that want to perceive uh, a different present and want to make a different reality for themselves. So I think she's a, you know, she's a model to follow because she had so many challenges. And with that, she continued to write and she found her little space, you know, and we can still 
uh, reflect upon all of her writings that she has, you know. Yeah, her most famous poem is called Hombres Necios. It's a very feminist poem for 1648. Uh, yes. But she also has plays, um, what were called Redondillas, which mm -hmm. is a sequence of rhyme poetry, songs, m a lot of religious, because she was mm -hmm. a nun after all. And yes. the reason she became a nun is that she believed that being in the convent would save her, would protect her so she could continue writing. Mm -hmm. um, because the other option would be to get married and she was not going to do that. So there's a couple of novels, una de Monica Lavin in, in um, Mexico about mm -hmm. her life. Another one by Alicia Gaspar de Alba, a Chicana mm -hmm. uh, writer in California. So they're really interesting. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in Sor Juana, you should read the novels too. Yes. Along with her work. <laughs> Should I read the, the poem, um, La yeah. Llorona Considers the State of Tortillas? Yes, yes, please, please. That's the title, La Llorona Considers the State of Tortillas. She knows they sell them in neat, neat packages, cellophane and counted. They come in whole wheat, yellow or white corn, even red, tinted and crisp, ready for tostada or chalupas. <laughs> Too easy, it seems to her, for the truth to be told. She also knows machines can never render a product true. If flour, one misses the familiar smell of dough cooking on the comal. The puffing up, one must simply must pat down to hear the poof of air escaping. The taste hot off the comal, melting butter or honey. If corn, the smell is sweeter, the touch rougher, the taste has vestiges of corn on the cob or pinole. El que tiene más saliva traga más pinole. Weeping woman weeps to see that chemicals preserve and make these tortillas last. I could write poems on the smooth surface or fold them up and eat them. Tortillas are at once food and utensil. I scoop up memories with each bite and La Llorona, weeping woman, smiles. Mm. Thank you. We're putting together a book on La Llorona and I'm gonna include this poem in it because I think it would be fitting. <laughs> it's yes, a, it would be fitting. Yeah, it's a, a hybrid book, which means that there will be poetry, maybe even a, an excerpt of a play also some academic essays. So it's gonna be an interesting project. Thank you, thank did, you. Did you wanna I, just talk? Do you wanna have like a conversation? Or yeah, um, yeah. No, it's, yeah, we could um, share, share with the community um, your writing process, maybe um, giving tips about how how you find inspiration to tell all these different stories, you know, whether it's a poem or it's your ethnobiography in La Canicula. So um, maybe giving folks a tip because in the audience, we're going to have potential writers, you know, and potential professors of literature. And so um, to them, we speak, you know, so, and to their parents uh, to support their writing, so. Yeah. Those are two different questions, I think. One is the one about the process that I go through when I create, when I create something. I mean, you can see all the books I have around here. Mm -hmm. uh, my house is full of books. So I take inspiration from other books, like mm -hmm. the Sor Juana poem, but also from life, uh, from stories that I hear or stories that I, I've known all my life from my family, mm -hmm. from my neighbors, my neighborhood. Me, me familia writ large. I mean, everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, pero luego, I mean, son tantos. Luego there's a process of like something me pega and I can't let it go. And until I write it, I'm not resting. It's just mm -hmm. there. I have to do it. Uh, it could be a phrase. It could be an image. Uh, in some cases, it's a full story that comes fully formed. 
and I just have to write it down. Not everything gets published, of course. Um, some things I write just for me uh, in my journal. That's a really good practice if you are thinking of becoming a writer. Keep a journal and write in it every day, even if it's only a few minutes, even if you only have 10 minutes, but write something that impressed you, something, the best thing that happened that day or the worst thing that happened. And uh, I find that that becomes kind of like a seed, una semilla, mm -hmm. so that later it blooms. And I'm talking sometimes years later is when I come back to something in a journal that stuck with me. And uh, so that's one question, the process. The second one is probably a little more, uh, I'm reading into your question about how do you become a writer? How do you do it? And I have been writing since I was nine, but I was not publishing, obviously, uh, not until I was, uh, gosh, in my 40s. You don't mm -hmm. have to wait that long, okay? You mm -hmm. should not wait that long. I was publishing poems here and there, but I didn't publish a book until my 40s, and that was Canicula. And um, the reason I waited so long, I was very insecure. I didn't see myself as a writer. I considered myself a teacher because I've always taught but not a writer. And I don't know why, because I was writing the whole time. And I, maybe it was what is now called the imposter syndrome. And, mm. Or there was no one there to tell me, why don't you publish these? Mm. <laughs> or give me encouragement. So I am here to tell you and to encourage you and tell you que si se puede, and you should do it. Especially si traes esa espinita that you want to share what you're writing. Because some of us write but don't want to share it. It's for us. And that's okay too. Um, the main thing to remember is that nobody can write you the way you do and your story. Because nobody knows that. It's only you. And that's one way to make it unique, to make it yours. Pero también it's a way to perhaps help others. And actually, that's kind of why I still publish, because I feel like if somebody can hear me read it or read it in a book and say, oh, that happened to me or that happened to my mother or that happened to my friend and have empathy, I think that's already a gift. Mm -hmm. También, if you see it and you learn something from it, then, of course, that would be the best thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, the, the stories about Halloween and Dia de los Muertos in 2020, it's not the same because of COVID and pandemia. And, mm -hmm. and so our Halloween is different from all the others. There won't be others like this. And mm -hmm. why not have you write about that? How is it different from previous years? And then come back to it 20 years from now and see how it's changed, which is what I did in, in the stories. I went back to that summer, I'm sorry, that fall when I did burn my leg and that happened. And then I flash forward 30 years when I went back with my tia to the Campo Santo and what happened there. Mm -hmm. and some of you may be asking yourself, why couldn't she go to the cemetery if her foot was <laughs> had a, a wound? Uh, it's a belief. It's a folk belief. It's still around. Some people still don't want to go to a cemetery or to a funeral if they are sick or if they have a, a cut, even something minor like a scratch. And I think, I don't know if it's true, that it's probably due to the hygienic, to be, for being hygienic and not um, risking an infection, because remember in the old days, they did not embalm bodies. I mean, it was just, if you died one day, you buried the next because they didn't have ways of doing that. Now you don't have to do that. They embalm the bodies and you can wait. And mm -hmm. so I don't think it's a matter of hygiene anymore. It's a matter of just belief and practice. Uh, and, and not everybody believes it. So but that's what it was when I was growing up and it's changed. And so what it is now, 20 years from now, it's going to be different. I mean, and it captures, and it captures a moment. I think um, it captures a moment in time because um, I remembered we were paralleling your canicula with, um, with, we were reading uh, the v Vietnam. And I think you have a story in canicula about one of your cousins my brother. 
Your, oh, it's your brother. Yeah, my um, brother was killed in Vietnam in 1968. Oh, well, I'm sorry for your loss. Um, and the, the students at the time were looking for voices, were looking for voices and stories of people. And I think that your Halloween stories, as well as your brother, it gives voice through you, it gives them their voice. So that if they're reading the history, they say, how was it in Texas? You know, here we live in California, but so many people from Texas have migrated here to California that it gives them um, a time. You know, it's like looking through a looking glass, you know, sort of like Alice in Wonderland. You know, you're able to see into this moment in time and you capture it. And so it gives them more information for them to analyze the realities, you know, like what's not on the page. You know, this is what the history book tells me. But then if I look at this piece of literature and I do a comparison, then um, it gives me a little bit more information along right. with news clippings, along with listening to the music, you know, so. Um, yeah, and especially with Vietnam, that was the war for my generation. Uh, my parents' generation, it was World War II. And my mom's cousins went to Korea and now our, our generation, the, the young people's generation now, it's Afghanistan and uh, the wars that we seem to constantly be engaged in. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that, that experience is there. It resonates. And I'm glad you brought up the geography because I am from Texas. I'm from the border here in Texas. But Chicanos and Chicanos across the country have mm -hmm. suffered similar uh, oppressions, regardless mm -hmm. of where. And my cousins who grew up in Chicago tell me about the bullying that they experienced as others in Chicago. Um, and sometimes it was black on, on brown and brown on black. And then there were gangs. All the things that you assume are in the past are still there in different mm -hmm. guise, maybe with different ideas, but it's the same kind of conflicts. Mm -hmm. Sadly, it's still yeah. around. And I hope that the writing, the poetry helps people to think about it um, and consider that it doesn't have to be. We can change that. We can create the world we want to be in. And, and if we change ourselves, we can change this world. And, and I think, thank you. And I think that through these events, through these cultural exchanges, it's creating um, unity, especially between people learning about different histories. You know, like um, I saw in the New York um, Times an article that came out about the Underground Railroad to Mexico and about um, Los Negro Mascogos and Coahuila and how people are starting to learn about all of these different places where there is unity of where there was oppression, but where people are coming together. And I think that um, that's really powerful. Um, yeah. I think back to when Jesse Jackson came here in 1985, when we had the Watsonville strike, there's a mural that Yermo Aranda is um, reworking here in Watsonville in honor of the, of the cannery workers. And, um, and I remember him coming to town and all of these people coming from San Francisco and just this, all these different people and how empowering it was back in 1985, you know, and how this little town began to change with all that wonderful energy that came. And, um, and we hope, you know, that we continue to make it a better place. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, Rufus you're Rata. welcome. Um, it's been a pleasure. Really, thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you.